Nearly 16 million children in the U.S. have inconsistent access to enough nutritious food. The American Heart Association recommends high school-aged children eat three servings of vegetables a day. In Tennessee, only 13% will achieve that goal. Nearly one in five adolescents skips breakfast. Disordered eating is our standard of living in America. One in three children in Tennessee drinks two or more sodas every day. One in three children is also obese or overweight. I see obesity as one of the most visible forms of malnutrition that we have today. Babies who are breastfed exclusively for six months experience fewer and less severe infections and see improved cognitive development. In Tennessee, only 4% of babies will be breastfed exclusively to six months, the lowest rate in the U.S. We are setting our children up to not be as healthy as they could potentially be. By age 15 to 18 months, the most common vegetable eaten by children in America is French fries. What is standing between us and a healthy relationship to food? Major funding for NPT Report's Children's Health Crisis is provided by the Healthways Foundation, addressing the critical issues of children's health and public education. The Nashville Healthcare Council. The HCA Foundation, on behalf of TriStar Health. And by members of NPT. Thank you. One responsibility we have as parents is to provide our children with healthy, nourishing food. Food that will help them grow and develop. But what happens when children don't get enough healthy food? And how do we know what is healthy to begin with? In this episode of Children's Health Crisis, we'll look at our relationship to food and examine why we eat what we eat and how that affects the health of our children. Stay tuned. The day is just getting started at Moreland Heights Elementary, part of Knox County Schools in Tennessee. Just like uh, handing a kid a book or giving them a bus ride to school, providing them a meal is a critical piece in the education and personal development of a student. District-wide Director of School Nutrition John Dickel wants kids to start their day right. Breakfast is probably the greatest area for growth and the greatest area of need. My primary role is to support the education process. My product that I help produce is not the food that the kids are served, it's the students that they will become and the adults that they become. Breakfast at this school is unique. Good morning. It's served in the classroom, not the cafeteria. Jalen breakfast, Kinsley breakfast. And it's free for every single student. We are in a really unique situation in time where uh, we have students that come to us that are nutritionally deficient. On the other hand, we have students that are on the other end of the spectrum that are suffering with childhood overweight or obesity. So school is for some of our students a sole source or close to sole source of nutrient dense food. We are very careful in how we craft our menu. Our breakfast menu usually has a minimum of three protein contributions a week. The offerings of whole grains, the fresh fruits and vegetables, provides them a more healthy body than just loading them up with an empty carbohydrate. Research shows children without reliable access to food perform worse on math problems and are more likely to have to repeat a grade level. When breakfast is offered, fewer children will be late or absent from school. You know, we hear research and we know statistics and the data, how important it is that children get to eat every morning. But just to get to come into the building every morning and know in my heart that my kids have eaten, is, it is just a great relief. I, I don't worry about them. And I, and I don't think you can research that. 
The American diet has really deteriorated over the last several decades. We have come to a place now where people are eating a lot of processed foods. They're not eating as many fresh fruits and vegetables. They're not eating as many homemade foods. And because of this, people are consuming significant amounts of sugar, of fat, and of sodium. The forces that drive what we eat are actually pretty straightforward. I think we eat things that we can afford, we eat things that we can get easily, and we eat things that taste good. And in our environment, unfortunately, the affordable, tasty, easily accessible foods are often not the ones that are good for us. The foundations of what we eat and why are shaped by food behavior set in infancy and early childhood. For experts, the early years are the most important. Even baby's first food sets the tone for the rest of life. Breast milk is a living fluid. It is genetically designed for the baby from whom its mother came from. So it's not just fats and proteins and sugars. It really is about the immune boosting qualities. There are many benefits to breastfeeding. In the short term, breastfed babies have fewer infections and gastrointestinal problems. Long term, research suggests breastfed babies have less risk of asthma, obesity, and certain types of cancer. But the benefits don't stop there. Breastfed babies know that they are getting full after they have consumed a certain amount of fat in the milk. And we know that the longer the baby stays on the breast, the higher the fat intake is toward the end of the feeding. Uh, the same is not true with bottle feeding. Um, bottle feeding, even breast milk, might not happen that same way. And formula is homogenized, so the fat is mixed throughout the entire feeding. When babies are able to regulate their own feeding time and time and time again, when we aren't watching clocks and stopping them, when we really watch their cues to let them know that they're in charge of their own food, that really does have a lifelong lasting effect of being able to understand what it means to be hungry and what it means to be satisfied without being overly full. I think that's a problem that a lot of us have even as adults. We should be eating when we are hungry and not eating just because Culturally, it's acceptable to do so. According to the 2013 Breastfeeding Report Card, 60% of moms in Tennessee will ever try to breastfeed their babies. By three months, 18% of babies will be breastfed exclusively. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends six months of exclusive breastfeeding only 4% of Tennessee babies will meet that goal, the lowest percentage in the U.S. How we respond, how our body will know if we're hungry or full, that set point, that thermostat, that lives in your brain, and your brain architecture is being developed as the fetus develops. It's then further developed in infancy and reinforced or not. So if you're overfed as an infant, you set your thermostat for a higher level. That means that you will continue to eat regardless of whether that's necessary to feed your body and your own growth. That's the opposite of what we consider to be functional good balance as you're developing. <laughs> Likewise, as you move into the ages of three to five, your body, your brain, your intestine, your muscles, your bone, Everything is being laid down. It's like the foundations of a house. You've got to build a strong foundation if you want to build your first and your second and your third story on top of it. As infants become toddlers, they move on to solid foods. In America, that often means graduating to the kids' menu. Once babies are weaned and start having solid food, that those first few months, I think parents are pretty careful, most parents, but I feel like something happens at age two. Hi there, what can I get for you? Yeah, I need to get. Where suddenly it seems like a good idea to take your child to McDonald's for a happy meal. Parents seem to want to give their child more of these foods that are just part of our culture, and that's when you need to be really careful. You're we are a family of five, mom and dad, three kids. Dawson, where's your elbow? 
both parents working. We go to church every week, twice a week sometimes, but you know, your typical family as you would find in Nashville anywhere. Sharika Proctor and her family consider themselves health conscious, but like many families, they were busy. I was working anywhere from 55 to 60 hours a week. Uh, so it was whatever I could pop in the microwave and pop out onto the table for the children. And if it was easier for me to stop at a local fast food chain, I would. The Proctors aren't alone. Fast and convenient foods have become the norm for families across America. As our society has changed and the role of women has changed and most families now have two working parents, we really are reliant on foods that are fast and foods that are easier to get on the dinner table. Let's see what you did in here. Okay, we got a little action going. After a career with the EPA, John Patrick has returned to his roots. He is testing a sustainable model of agriculture on a small farm near Nashville, Tennessee. For John, what we eat is determined by what we plant. I would say in the 1920s, there was a subtle shift to the way we farm, and that's when subsidies began. After 1970, things have changed dramatically, and that's when the USDA started pushing more and more subsidies going out to large farms, and it was directed toward commodities. And the large farms were pushed by Earl Butts, who was agricultural secretary at the time, and his famous words are, get big or get out. As a result, commodity crops in the U.S. did get big. Production of corn, soy, wheat, cotton, and rice ballooned in the United States. It pushed us toward a surplus of certain commodity crops. Corn was the number one, followed closely by soy because they, usually they go in a rotation. So that changed what we're gonna do with all this food that we're growing, and where was it gonna go? In the case of corn, one use was high fructose corn syrup. With it, food manufacturers could sweeten their products at a fraction of the price of sugar. It's in the corn syrup, it's in the fruit drinks, it's in the ice cream, it's in the baked goods, it's prevalent. Today, conservative estimates say all Americans over the age of two consume an average of 132 calories from high fructose corn syrup every day. Last year, 95.4 million acres of corn were planted in the U.S., with around 4 million of those acres destined for high fructose corn syrup. To put that in perspective, the top 34 vegetables planted in the U.S. measure a combined 1.7 million acres. Of all the cropland in the United States, 60% of it is planted in grains. 2% of it is planted in fruits and vegetables. That doesn't match the dietary suggestion by the USDA. If you look at my plate, it's pretty much split up into little 25% quarters where you have grains, meat, fruits, and vegetables, and a little dish over here, dairy. So grains over here is 25%, and we have fruits and vegetables, which make up almost 50%. So we have 60% land growing 25% of the grain, and we have 2% that's growing the 50%. That's way out of balance. Shouldn't we be growing more fruits and vegetables? Shouldn't we be incentivizing those farms to be more diverse? I see obesity as one of the most visible forms of malnutrition that we have today. While we are consuming excess amount of calories, the nutrients per calories are so low that we are not actually getting what we need to grow healthy. So we are malnourished as we are overweight. The question is, are we to blame for the foods we eat, or is it our environment that has conditioned us to consume? People think that they're eating because they've chosen to eat, but I think that the research is just so clear that our environment makes a huge difference in what we end up eating. Typically, when you're around food, you eat more. And what we have seen over the past couple of decades is an increase in our surrounding of food. 
Your appetite just wrote a check that only a sandwich of this magnitude can cash. You're constantly reminded that you're hungry and you're constantly reminded that something looks good. And so, you know, you eat first with your eyes and then your nose and the last place you eat is with your mouth. Highly processed, calorie-rich foods are not only abundant, they're also the most heavily marketed foods. The food and beverage industry spends $1.6 billion every year in marketing directly targeted to children and adolescents. With the magic of his la -dee -da. Well, the products that are advertised most often to kids and teens are sugary cereals, fast food, candy, and sugary drinks. I don't think there's a big economic incentive to advertise healthy fruits and vegetables to kids. On television alone, children see about 13 food ads every day and teens see over 16 ads a day. Now you don't even have to be sitting in front of a screen to get the ads. Kids are getting ads on their iPhones, their iPads, basically wherever they are. Even marketing at the grocery store directly targets children. Think about the middle of a supermarket aisle. The, the highest sugar cereals and the ones with the biggest cartoon characters are always going to be eye level with the child that's in the shopping cart. Manufacturers realize that in order to quiet a child, you'll say, okay, fine, that's what we'll buy. But human biology is also compelling us towards certain foods. We preferentially move towards foods that are high in fat and high in sugar and high in salt. We're not thinking about it, we just move in that way. And it's because we used to live in more of a feast or famine condition and you couldn't predict it. So if you scan the horizon, which is what you're doing with your eyes all the time, we preferentially go to high fat, high sugar, high salt. And in that way, we create storage so that if we were to happen upon a time of famine, we would survive. In this environment where that is no longer an advantage, but it becomes a disadvantage, this is a great challenge for us. All of this means that in order to navigate the current food environment, you have to have your guard up, but not everyone has the same level of defense. In Tennessee, one in four children is food insecure. When you're food insecure, that means you're not getting enough calories. You're not eating nutritiously. Second Harvest Food Bank of Middle Tennessee is a part of the food system that often goes under the radar. It's usually by the third week of the month that we start receiving calls from individuals. Aaliyah, Aaliyah. that's beautiful. All right. And so they need something to supplement through the end of the month. Hi, y'all. This is Joanne. Hi, Joanne. How you doing? Thank y'all. They're individuals that are really struggling. They have jobs. They're underemployed. They may have unusual expenses, such as high utility bills. And so then they have to make decisions. Do I pay my utility bill? Do I pay my house note? Or do I put food on my table? In the past, food banks like Second Harvest have relied on non-perishable processed foods to fill bellies. Food banks traditionally, we would just take whatever came to us, and we will always take those donations. Now we've started looking at what type of food we are giving out to people. Food insecurity is often concentrated and people living in areas with high food insecurity can have trouble finding fresh fruits and vegetables. Well, where I live is an older part of Nashville. The closest place to get something to eat is pretty much a strip of fast food restaurants. There's one grocery store there. And I'll be honest, the grocery store has changed its name, I think, two or three times since the five years I've been in that area. So I'm not really all that comfortable going there. It's going to take me at least 35 minutes to go to a grocery store or anywhere that has fresh produce. So that's frustrating. For people to truly have choice so that they can make healthy choices, that means that the food offerings need to be accessible, affordable, and acceptable. Those three elements are very important. 
Vanderbilt University is researching what it takes for families to improve their diet and overall health. We focused in two of the most under-resourced community areas. So that's in South Nashville and Northeast Nashville. These are very diverse communities and they serve many different types of people, but many of them deal with the issue of food insecurity. Focusing on families with children ages three to five, the GROW trial is banking that if interventions can work in food insecure areas, they can work anywhere. We give very simple advice. Start with the outskirts of any type of grocery store. That's where you're gonna see fruits and vegetables. That's where you will see the things that are closest to how nature intended them to be. Start on the outside and then be intentional as you walk down the middle of those aisles what you're buying and why you're buying it. Families participating in the GROW trial meet for 12 weeks with a trained counselor. Together they will learn cooking skills, how to create a balanced diet, and how to read a food nutrition label. When you read a label, rather than understanding the entire label, we'll teach you a tool, which is looking at sugar and fiber content. So less than 10 for sugar, higher than 5 for fiber. What number is that? Seven. Is seven bigger than five? Yes. Awesome. So we can get this one, right? Perfect. The trial also includes lessons on parenting, how to manage screen time, and encourage things like getting enough sleep and enough physical activity. So a lot of what we do is about being intentional of how we make our choices and interact with our environment to feed our bodies. It's healthier to slow down when you eat. If you can actually extend your eating time to about 20 minutes, then your body can give you cues to let you know, are you full? Should you stop eating? Or are you still hungry? Should you keep eating? You override the automaticity by being intentional. And it's doable, but it is not the default of how we currently interact with our environment. Once the classes are complete, participants will routinely check back in and can call a counselor when they have questions. The GROW trial will last three years and involve 600 families. Wow. With the GROW Vanderbilt program, it's taught us that eat what you feel is comfortable, but just create some habits and know what's healthy. Come on guys, it's time to eat. Taking the time to read a label in the store can be a little tedious when you have three kids, but if you have them involved, it's an excellent educational tool. I want them to understand what they are eating. I mean, it's not about being the perfect nutritionist at all. Um, it's all about just making better choices for you and your family. Parents can only take their children so far. Eventually, children have increasing control over the food they eat. The motivations for food behaviors become complicated as children reach adolescence. The social pressure on kids today is entirely different than when I was a kid. What I'm seeing the most of is this pressure to be perfect. Now perfect entails a lot of different things including athleticism, grades, um, performing on a stage, etc. But what seems to be kind of an underlying trend is body image. Kids, as soon as they learn how to read, write, talk, move around the world, they become aware of their mass on this planet. So what I'm seeing a lot of at this point is uh, these kids are trying to control food, control their relationship with food, try to dominate their body in an effort to be quote unquote perfect. We live in an environment with very mixed messages when it comes to food. On the one hand, we are targeted by the industry, especially children and adolescents, to eat high calorie, energy dense foods that contribute to weight gain. At the same time, what we see from the fashion industry, from the diet industry, are messages that really communicate that an individual needs to be thin in order to achieve success in our culture. Research shows bullying based on weight is the most common form of bullying in the school setting. But it also happens at home. Children are vulnerable to weight stigma, even from parents and siblings. And the consequences of this are very devastating for children. Weight-based bullying leads to things like depression, anxiety, low self-esteem, 
poor body image, even suicidal thoughts and behaviors. And it also leads to a range of negative health behaviors. Uh, things like engaging in very extreme weight loss methods, engaging in binge eating or eating more food, or avoiding things like physical activity, uh, often because physical activity settings are where these children get teased the most. When left unchecked, negative behaviors can develop into mental illnesses, such as eating disorders. There are spikes in trends of eating disorder onset. A lot of spikes we'll see around middle school and high school. That seems to be a really uh, vulnerable population. Eating disorders are on the rise, especially among males. There are a lot of myths about eating disorders. A huge myth is that it's a girl problem. Another big myth surrounding eating disorders is that you have to be overweight or underweight to have an eating disorder, and that's simply not true. It's not about weight, it's not about the food, it's about your relationship with your weight and your food. Okay, are you guys ready to eat? Yeah. Yeah. I'm hungry. Okay. I'm it's supposed to be pleasurable to eat. What food is not supposed to do is trigger any positive or negative feelings about our self or our place in this world. We really need messages that empower children and families to be healthy regardless of what their body size is. But the second step is that we need to create an environment that makes it easy for families to be healthy. For someone who's really looking for the opportunity to make some small changes, the dinner table is a great place to start. Family meals in every study, they come out looking like a positive thing. It sounds simple, it actually takes a lot of work to get dinner on the table every night, but I do feel like it's an investment that's worth it. I used to feel that the school food environment mimicked culture. And I think today, the school food environment, we are affecting culture by what we're serving. It goes beyond just feeding the kids. It's creating a better uh, life for our students uh, beyond their time that they spend in school. Everyone should have access to enough nutritious food and understand what the body needs to grow and develop. In our current food environment, it's not always easy to know what is healthy. But reclaiming food as a source of nutrition and sustenance, listening to our bodies, and allowing hunger and satisfaction cues to drive the way we eat will help us find balance. And eating a greater variety of foods will point us in a direction of better health. Please join me in learning more about the children's health crisis in Tennessee and what you can do about it by tuning in to NPT and by going online to wnpt.org slash children's health. Major funding for NPT Report's children's health crisis is provided by the Healthways Foundation, addressing the critical issues of children's health and public education. The Nashville Healthcare Council, the HCA Foundation on behalf of TriStar Health and by members of NPT. Thank you.